HiSec Buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. You're live. Welcome to Talking In Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Madderall here with you today. We're going to cover the Alliance Tournament with our friend Suetonia, and we're going to go into some of the mining changes and where they stand right now. Those two things, plus the news for the next hour, hour and a half for this podcast. Let's meet our panel here with um, uh, Suetonia. Hey, how how is everyone? Good. Uh, Suetonia specializes in player versus player combat, spaceship combat, uh, etc. And sorry about the etc. There's much more to it than that. And we also have Khan with us today. How is it going, Khan? It's going all right. It's going all right. All right. Astraeus Khan uh, from Friends of Ashra Khan. He is uh, a mining expert. And uh, our engineer and other voice today is Nick Bison, also a miner. How are you doing, Nick? It's a good day. Happy Sunday, all. Right. All right. Uh, by the way, Nick, can you check uh, the camera? Because it looks like the, uh, the look is kind of odd. Can you? It sure is. I was just looking at that. I'm trying to figure yeah. out what the heck's going on. Yeah, check that out. Uh, I don't know if that's... Anyway... Uh, all right, well, let's start with the Alliance Tournament, which actually just happened. For those that don't know, the Alliance Tournament was something that started, um, gosh, when was that started? 2004, 2006, 2007, right around there, long time ago. And it was um, basically uh, at, at the beginning, it was a three-person on three-person tournament that later turned into a whole team uh, sometimes you had 11 members, sometimes you had uh, nine, uh, just depends on how it evolved. And it's been going for a long time now. There was a period of about two years, I think. Suetonia, help me out. How long was the uh, Alliance tournament absent recently? Uh, there was like a, a three-year gap between AT16 and AT17. But uh, it would have been a year gap normally, so I guess you could say there was a two-year hiatus. Right, where it, where it didn't... Uh... They actually stopped it until they could put it in a better form, which they did. It came back this year with the help of some of the uh, community team, but they also brought in EVNT, which is an outside group, and they managed to put on the Alliance tournament, uh, which uh, which actually just finished. And there was two sections to it. I think at the beginning there was um, trials to qualify, and uh, after that, uh, just a couple weeks ago, they actually had the tournament that lasted over two weekends, and that was just decided last weekend around uh, this time, actually. The two teams that uh, were made it into the finals were Hydra Reloaded and Volta, or we form Volta. And uh, Suetonia is part of Volta, so he was in that tournament at the very top, at the very finals, uh, competing. Oh, well, I wasn't actually. I didn't actually have anything to do with the uh, We Form Volta tournament team as much as I'd love to, you know, claim credit for their second place uh, <laughs> victory. I, I was, I was just part. Of, I was part of the production side of things. Oh. I, I didn't have anything to do with the like team. But that's normally your team, isn't it? Uh, no, actually, I've never played uh, with Volta in a live tournament. Normally, I'm uh, on the Hydra Loaded team. The, Hydra the last team. time I played was in AT15 with Hydra. Wow, you've been a commentator ever since. Uh, yeah, I've worked with uh, Even T pretty much uh, since then. Uh, I, I've helped Even T with uh, AT14, AT15, AT16, uh, the Alliance Open, and now uh, this tournament too, as well as some of their uh, live events like the Kodari, Kodari Corporation Cup. Yeah, the uh, sorry about that. Why do I equate you with Volta? Tell me why I'm thinking that. Because I, I'm in Volta, so you know. <laughs> so, so you're in Volta. You have nothing to do with their team. You actually fly with Hydra. Oh no, I, I don't fly with Hydra. I don't fly with uh, any team. Uh, sorry. Right. Wh while I'm part of the production, I don't like flying with the team because you know, number one, there's like a little bit of a conflict of interest because you know, behind the scenes, you. That you know you look, you get some you know extra information that's not available available to everyone else, and also uh, uh, you know I I want to like focus on doing the best thing that I can do. So you know like being split between two tasks, we're playing in a team, and and doing the production thing is also you know 
All right, I'm, I'm, I'm poking around trying to corner you and to try to figure out, uh, okay, so you're in Volta. When we're talking about we form Volta, the ones that were in the tournament, right? Or is it a different Volta? Uh, we form Volta is the uh, alliance we form Volta, and it's uh, largely uh, the, the same team that's been playing for years together, like going back 10 years now, probably. All right, and that's your, that's your in-game team. That's who you hang out with and do stuff with. Fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I'm part of Volta. Okay. Good. Although right. I am like an anti-social solo PvP, so <laughs> that's why you're here, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, we established that. Got it. Okay. Next part is you were on Hydra Reloaded in the past. That's been your tournament team. Yeah. Okay. But after 2015, you're only doing uh, commentary and and stuff like that. Oh yeah, eighty fifteen, not two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen is a lot longer, a lot, yeah. a lot longer than. Okay, eighty fifteen, which happened in what two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen, yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, I think I got it. All right, thank you for straightening uh, all that out. I'm a little less confused now. All right, so you were part of the production. Uh, what would you think? Tell us about it. I think this tournament was like a massive success. I believe uh, if if uh, people want to, they can. I think Ash Trophy did an interview with CCP Aurora and CCP Swift, which is like a two hour interview, and uh, you can like listen to CCP Aurora, who's like amazing, and she done like so much uh, work on this. But uh, I think they 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 consider this to be like a massive uh, massive success. Great. Just because uh, I believe the peak view account was like over nine thousand. Once you like count all of the like Russian and. Uh, like Japanese, the alternative language streams that they had on as well. That's actually higher than it was lately, right? Uh, let's say, let's take it back to 2017. I think the finals got like 5,000, right? Or was it more than that? Yeah, it, it might even be a bit less than that. I think it was around uh, 4,500. Uh, the uh, Alliance number 16 uh, also didn't fill out like a, like the level of interest between the teams has been like massively different between these two tournaments. Mm -hmm. Like uh, 80 16, I believe, uh, it was uh, meant to be a 64 person tournament, but there wasn't actually 64 teams who signed up to it. So there, there was actually, you know, that actually had to like give some teams buys to go in because they, there wasn't enough people for the full tournament whereas this one i believe there was something like 90 teams that signed up mm -hmm. which was uh, pretty insane i think it was like yeah, 95 yeah. teams there's some pent-up demand they call that yeah i mean yeah. it's been it's been away for uh, quite a while so i guess there's a lot of excitement for it to you know take part in the at again yeah all right, so uh, Alliance Tournament, uh, the, the actual, <laughs> we probably should have started with the headline, the winner of the Alliance Tournament was? Hydra Reloaded. Hydra Reloaded, okay. Finally. Let's, uh, let's open the envelope, right? <laughs> Finally, what do you mean? Are they, they're returning uh, something to Hydra, Hydra have always done very well in tournaments. Right. Uh, um, they've come second place, I believe, five times. But they they have they 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 the last time they officially won the alliance tournament was eighty nine, which was you know like over, well over a decade ago wow. at this point. Yeah, um, they've always been a top team, but they did uh, I guess have a long absence. There was also a, a like a meme version of them, right? Vidra reloaded. Yeah, so uh, in AT13, Hydra got disqualified because uh, the two team captains had like some collusion agreement together to make a best of three game become a best of one. Essentially, uh, Hydra got DQ'd for that. And so a bunch of, I believe some, uh, uh, Hydra didn't enter AT14. And I think as a joke, some Russian players uh, made like a joke alliance called Vidra Reloaded. And okay. uh, unfortunately, the Hydra and Vidra ended up like being team partners and ended up in like two finals together. So it, it also uh, looks pretty funny to see like Hydra versus Vidra in the finals. Yeah, yeah. All right. But this tournament, tell us some of the highlights. In your eyes, what were some of the highlights? Oh, like matches or do you mean like the format in general? Because there's a lot to talk about, I think. Yeah. Why don't we talk about the format and then highlights? Yeah, so I guess the the big change in the format this year uh, is that the, there's eighty prizes for eighty prize ships, I should say, mm -hmm. for the top sixteen teams instead of the top four teams. So traditionally in the alliance tournament, uh, the only the top four teams would get prize ships, and these are you know unique 
Alliance tournament ships. Uh, they have uh, very good stats for what they are. They're unique. Normally, there's only a limited amount, and CSP will never create new copies. Although that might change uh, next year if uh, they don't make new AT ships, they might re-release the the Mimmer and the Freki. Yeah. So they're they're super valuable. So and because now that the top sixteen teams uh, can potentially win some of them instead of just the top four, it opens it up to like a lot more uh, of the you know teams who you know not aren't quite as dedicated as like you know Hydra, the Tuskers, Templars, uh, Vidra, uh, yeah. those like super teams that almost always win. Yeah, because they train all the time, right? They have all the they're a small team. They know each other very well. They train a lot, therefore they uh, and they're very very good at um, theory crafting. Uh, and so they have a lot of advantages. Not everybody has the time or the team or those kinds of advantages, and they can still get something out of this is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, essentially, uh, you actually had to win two, you know, the first two games if you mm -hmm. bought into the tournament to be guaranteed prize ships. As long as you were in the winner's bracket for the second weekend or you won the first loser's uh, bracket match, on the third day, you, you're guaranteed to get two, uh, two of each prize ship. And we actually saw a ton of newer teams uh, who you know have never uh, achieved like uh, a lot of prize ships getting uh, prize ships this year. And there was also a lot of uh, pretty interesting upsets too. Yeah. Oh, who got upset? I'd like to hear that first. Uh, probably probably Templis is probably the, the oh. biggest known upset because uh, Waffles, which is a team... Uh, that traditionally uh, they, they normally like you know maybe win a game against like a bad team and then they lose two games like their like average the average win loss record was something like one win two losses, but they actually ended up uh, beating Templis in a game and Templis were the favorite to win because Templis won the probably the last two tournaments uh, Anger Games and the the Alliance Open, which was the EVNT sort of you know pseudo Alliance tournament last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, yeah. favored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another big change to the format too is you can't bring uh, Alliance tournament ships into the AT anymore. Oh, that is a big change. And the reason that's a big change, correct me if I'm wrong, is that those things, um, well, I, I think when you're in an Alliance tournament, you get to say the, the opponent can't take one or two ships. And so what Alliance tournament ships allow you to do is if your logistics pilot, your repair ship is knocked out of the game because it's been called out as blocked, you can actually bring in an Alliance tournament ship uh, to fill that role. And it usually fills it even better. Uh, so it has advantages. These AT ships have advantages inside the Alliance tournament itself. Is that right? Something like that? Yeah, so uh, Alliance tournament ships, obviously, they're more powerful than regular ships. Like, for example, a Cambion is like a Hawk, except it's faster, it does more damage, and it has more tanks. So if you can bring Cambions instead of Hawks, then you, you have a huge advantage, uh, uh, potentially, in a game, right? And in, in particular, there's, uh, there's a few Alliance tournament ships. Uh, like you mentioned, the Logistics Cruisers. The Atana, which is from AT10, and the Rebisi, which is from AT14, which are basically like Super Basilisk or Super Guardian. Uh, yeah. They, they, you could use those to like circ circumvent logistic bands. Right, and but you can't do that anymore. So that tactics out. No, so uh, you know, there, there's there's uh, positive aspects of this. There, mm -hmm. There's a few negative aspects, I guess. The the positive aspects is it opens up the playing field a lot more to uh, teams who aren't able to acquire Alliance tournament ships because it you know it, it was sort of like a win more kind of thing. You know, the teams that won yeah. prior ships would win more prior ships because they had the prior ships to bring, and then also like super rich teams who can afford to you know spend four hundred billion isk on an Atana obviously have an advantage over maybe like a newer team that maybe have a budget of like say 50 billion or so uh the, the downside of course is that we don't see the the prior ships blowing up in tournament matches anymore it used to be like super fun to see you know like a 400 bill ship go down in a in a game or yeah there, there was a, there was actually like a really crazy match in the last summer 12 mm -hmm. i think it was pandemic legion versus the camel empire uh where uh, pl mm -hmm. and camel they both bought like maraca Cremoas comps which are like 80 prize ships. And more ISK dest was destroyed in that one Alliance tournament match than the Battle of Asakai. <laughs> God, that's a lot. It's funny you say like, you know, teams that are a little poorer, like 50, you can only spend 50 billion on their AT budget. That just seems like a lot.
Oh, well, well, 50 billion is kind of reasonable, but uh, yeah, there definitely are teams that probably spent less than that and still were fairly successful. Right. All right. What other uh, uh, highlights were there about the tournament itself? Is there any anything that you liked about it? Yeah, so I, I really like the prize structure now. The, uh, the the top 16 winning prize ships instead of the top four means that we saw like a ton more, uh, ex especially uh, the second day. Like normally uh, the first weekend of the Alliance tournament is generally not like super interesting because it's a lot of like bad teams versus bad teams and like the good teams just dunking bad teams. But uh, a lot of the matches were like super exciting because because if you uh, if you survive to the to the second weekends you, you already had to win like two games i think to get there so there, there was a lot of like teams like bringing out flagships and like matches that had like even against like even when they were like two like relatively unknown teams uh the matches were like super interesting super explosive like teams were going all out because they knew if they if they could just get into the top 16 then you know you get two of each of the new prize ships so wow it's excellent uh, all right, so you're a fan of this new uh, tournament style? Yeah, uh, I, def I definitely like the uh, the new format a lot. Uh, the meta was uh, super interesting this year too. There was like normally in the Alliance tournament, there's only like two to three sort of dominant comps, yeah. and then maybe like two two to three like kind of counter comps. But in this Alliance tournament, there were so many like viable comps that you you generally couldn't predict what teams were going to bring. There, there was like six or seven different like comp compositions that were all like end game good, so yeah. uh, it, it was uh, really exciting to watch for that. It wasn't just you know like I don't know a live tournament twelve where it's just uh, drone spam or marauders and that's it. It yeah. was really exciting to see. Or that uh, if I hear Tinker one more time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean that the, there still are some like pseudo Tinkers. There actually was one in the final, I believe, which was mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. And Tinker was a a, a certain, again, theory crafted uh, team composition that was very popular and hard to break if it was played right with good pilots and stuff. All right, well, do uh, you think uh, the Alliance tournament is it going to come back next year? Uh, yeah, it's already confirmed that it's coming back next okay. year by uh, CCP Aurora. So, and they've already like got the budget for it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, excellent, good. Yeah, right. um, one of the things that CSP Aurora has been doing is she's been making it so she's like uh, changed it so it's almost always going to come back. She's uh, essentially like Did she read it in the constitution or something. Uh, yeah, so like th things like you know like the prize ships, for example, uh, they they've talked about like bringing back some of the old ones. So if if for whatever reason CCP doesn't decide that the Alliance tournament is you know worthy of uh, so much uh, you know of their uh, Development time. Uh, right? Development time, yeah, that, that she can bring it back uh, herself. Uh, basically, the community team is more than capable of running it themselves. They don't need any, don't need like many, much assist, uh, assistance from like, you know, the art team or, you know, game designers and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Good for her. Like, uh, if you're wondering what Aurora is doing, she's saving the Alliance tournament. So, yeah, it's just uh, when. When CCP, Swift, yeah. right. when, CCP, when CCP Swift joined uh, CCP, the announcement came out like a week later, and everybody was like, oh, you saved the tournament. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Aurora had done so, so much work over the past, what, probably nine months, maybe even a year to get this approved and, and back up. And uh, for anyone who likes the tournament in general, even if you don't uh, – participate uh you probably owe her a beer or something at fan fest next year yeah. yeah aurora put in so much work man uh, uh she's been like staying like past like 8 p.m in the office like almost every day for like the last few weeks so yeah and well, uh, i mean stupid amounts of work and and i mean that's part of her job as the community team to a certain degree but the at in general on the weekends when they come in and stuff that's all not paid time for them wow uh swift made that point too he was very e eager to give credit to uh where it belonged 
And uh, and so he when he came on, and the reason that's important is because CCP, CCP Swift was Elise Randolph. Elise Randolph was highly associated with the Alliance tournament as well as a commentator and a big advocate for it. So when he arrived as a community member now for CCP, uh, the Alliance tournament popped up and everybody was super happy. He made sure that people knew that the work to do that was his colleague, uh, CCP Aurora. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, more on the Alliance tournament here. What were some of the team? Because one of the best things about the Alliance tournament for players, I think, if you're uh, if you're somebody in uh, Eve Online, tournament really relate to EVE Online or is it just a specialized racetrack for, you know, Formula 500 drivers? No, it's great recruiting. You do really well in the tournament. Your name of the, your corporation or your alliance, actually your alliance, will uh, attract some people. You may, you may find that people like your style of fighting in the alliance tournament and want to join your team. So what were some of the highlights for you, Sutonia, this alliance tournament? Who were, who were some uh, new faces maybe, or some old faces that are, you know, proving they're really good. Yeah. So there, there's a ton of like uh, newer teams that haven't done like particularly well before that have done really well. Uh, this last tournament, like I mentioned waffles before they upset templates. I believe they made it to the top six or the top eight at least, wow. which for, for a team that had an average win loss, like ratio of like one win to two losses. Like it's uh, really good to see them do very well. Uh, in this tournament there's also like a few others that have sort of uh shown up like we had platinum sensitivity they were like a japanese like like loosely like just japanese pdpers mostly uh they're not actually all in the same alliance either there's uh, there's a new thing called the mercenary rule this at where if you're not part of an alliance that's participating in the at you can uh, sign up as a mercenary for another alliance which is uh really awesome because it also helps like you know some groups like spectrally uh, you know, those kind of like MPSI groups or, uh, you know, if matter or if you were in like a one man corp and, you know, you probably don't <laughs> want to leave your, you don't want to leave your corp, right. But you right. could, uh, you know, sign up and help NC or whatever. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have talking in stations teams with, uh, all stars from all over the galaxy? Sounds good. Uh, I like that rule. I think that flexibility is pretty cool. It reminds me of the flexibility of what they were talking about when they were looking at corporations and how uh, players should organize themselves inside of EVE Online, because that corporation alliance structure, that hierarchy is dated. Uh, and you have players taking it upon themselves to make groups, social groups, to cross boundaries of corporations. And so seeing this it, it kind of CCP sanctioned uh, group uh, or differential on the group theory is interesting and maybe that will come into eve online at some point they've talked about how they were going to do this a while ago but uh, they haven't done anything on it this is the first i've seen any them do anything on that all right cool so tony thanks uh by the way question from the audience have uh, the prizes been distributed yet that people get their ships uh, no the the prizes aren't actually even on the sissy yet they don't have any stats or anything yet I assume it's probably going to take like a, a couple of months for them to get developed and put on to TQ and hand it out. But that's yeah. fairly standard for for uh, for the tournament. You don't get don't the prizes like the next day. Yeah, it's they take months. But but they don't have stats. How do they know what they're winning? Could be a clown well, ship. Well, we yeah, well the, the bonuses not. have been announced and the like oh. concept of the ships is announced. But we we don't know like how many mids they have. We don't know how much power grid it has, how much damage it does. But we know <laughs> that we know what the ships are. So yeah. like the uh, the frigate is like a soup is like a Gamma and a Karis crossbreed. So it's going to be a Gamma with a damp oh. bonus and an even bigger point range and probably does the same DPS and speed as a Gamma, if not more, because it's an AT ship. And then the uh, cruiser is a uh, Onyx Orphus hybrid. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a hick with a even longer point range than a regular hick, and it's going to be as fast as an Orphus, probably do the same DPS as an Orphus, and like tank as well as a, an Onyx. So both of those ships, we kind of know what they're going to be like. We just don't know the exact stats for them yet. Oh, interesting. All right. Well, thanks, Antonio, for the Alliance tournament. Again, that just ended last weekend. And uh, congratulations to uh, Aurora, the team at Eve NT, including Sutonia. And all the fans that were watching it, nearly 10,000 people watching the finals. Congratulations to CCP on a successful tournament. We look forward to the next one next year. Okay. 
Uh, we had some people sneak in here. You guys know Kenneth Feld. He's been talking. He's a CSM member along with Suetonia. How's it going, Kenneth? Uh, how's it going? Sorry about being a little bit late. Uh, uh, working night shift in Europe. I just woke up. Uh, you're all over the place. Don't worry. I don't even know what time. Just had daylight savings or whatever. Also in here is Shen. How are you doing, Shen? Doing well. Hello, hello. You know him from The Daily Show. All right, guys, we have the round table. We're going to talk about uh the elephant in the room that's sitting on top of all of us suffocating us and that is industry uh kenneth get us up to speed what's changed since we last talked oh my uh yeah um <laughs> well the dev blog got looked at by the player base and um a, a few people might have been upset about it um so less, less than four thousand yeah, somewhere around there, uh, <laughs> plus or minus. Uh, yeah. So um, we uh, we were we were we had an emergency meeting last week and um, went over a few things. Um, some of which was put out in a forum post. Um, those are the definitive changes. I think the big thing off the top was compression was um, shelved until 2022. Um, there, there were some, some big problems with that. Like if you took an average, um, R64 moon and just took the R64 portion at about 30%, which is about average for, for that type of moon, it would take you, it would take one workable somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 60 hours to compress the moon goo just from or the moon or just from that moon. And that only includes the R64. That doesn't include anything else. So um, I was working behind the scenes to try and um, give my input to, to that process. And uh, at the end of the day, it was just decided that, that due to some of the other work that was going to have to be done, I think that that was going to be pushed off until next year, which was probably a good decision because there's, there's a lot, still a lot of stuff to do even for the patch. But um, the thing that I really wish gas compression got in, because I really think that will help, uh, you know, the gas is going to be doubled. Um, they are giving the exhumers and barges gas mining modules. So there'll be some uh, opportunity for quite a bit of huffing out there. And I, I would, uh, excuse me. They call it scooping now, don't they? Oh, okay. I, huffing I'm has connotations up. of like spray paint in a sock, I think. So they're like, spray paint. what? <laughs> Didn't you grow up in the seventies? Okay, never mind. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the yeah, uh, okay. I lived on it, an island. We didn't have anything <laughs> like that. I, just, I don't know. Anyway, okay. Yeah, Any, exactly. Anyway, so yeah, there, there'll be a lot more opportunity from that. But getting the gas, even what we have now, out of wormholes is a logistical pain in the rumpus. And uh, now you're just going to have double that pain minus wastage. So figure, you know, 40, 50% more pain available. And uh, I, I don't know that people are going to do it. So we really need to get gas compression in there. And, all right. Um, but, com but all compression is kicked down the road to next year, which is not around the corner, but it's kicked down the road uh, to the next probable patch. That means without compression, not just for gas, but for everything else, is uh, they leave, they're leaving compression the way it was before. So you still have it, but it's the way it was before. Yeah, you Correct. still have it for it, ice and uh, you still have it for ice and ore, but you don't have it for the moon and gas stuff. I see. All right. Yeah. So, and it's still going to be instant. Nothing's going to change there. It's it's going to be like compression was just never never brought up. Mm hmm. All right. My first question is a fundamental question. We talked about this action. Dream, but how did you, uh, as a CSM member council of Stellar Management, a player representative group, Suetonia is in that group too. How did you guys let this happen? How did it, how did it come out this way? Mm, Suetonia, <laughs> um, the, uh, it, I mean it's pretty simple. CCP presented a plan 
uh, we gave our feedback and they said, thank you. And, um, and yep, that. Mm, and there you go. Okay. So it comes out, there's a reaction to it across the board. There's a nice, there's a nice blog by Dunk Dinkle it puts out a lot of this, a lot of the arguments. He's a former CSM member. A lot of the arguments that some people are having and uh, CCP says, hey, we're looking at all this stuff and we have an open process and we're inviting you to participate. And so is it, is that different than before? Because they usually say that kind of thing, but they don't really mean it according to players. Uh, this, this blog in particular, the player base has been asking for years, let us see stuff earlier. Let us test stuff earlier. So for the first time that I know of in quite some time, they actually did that. They put the stuff out on Sissy. You know, the, the ice right. compression didn't work. You know, there, was, there wasn't icons for this stuff. It was just uh, the, the basic blueprint icon for the, the compression modules. Um, you couldn't drag and drop and load them. You had to right click and load them. You know, so there was, there was some, some, some issues there, but they sort of kind of worked and you got an idea uh, you could get an idea how wastage work. Even I don't think the Type B crystals had wastage yet, um, but but you could still get the idea, right? That's a huge step for CCP. And internally on the CSM, we've said, you know, hey, this is this is this is good. Don't let the people being so mad discourage you from doing this in the future. You know, get the stuff out early, especially for large changes like this. So. That, that, that aside, um, some of the other things with Dunk Dinkle and Steve Renukin also wrote a blog. I've, I've seen this stuff since April. Sutunia only saw it once he got on CSM 16, but I had five, five and a half pages of notes. So when we had our meeting last week, it was just like, you know, flip back 20 pages in my notebook. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. This is the, the stuff that I had been looking at for a while now. And now it was time for input and the, the forum post. Uh, again, uh, CSM doesn't get to, to say, hey, we want this, we want this. And, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll just change this to, you know, five and this to 12. You know, it's, it's more of a uh, shaping process is the easy way to put it. You know, we don't always get everything we want. And... The CCP kind of capitulates on some things that, you know, they had a line in the sand and maybe that line got uh, mushed over by a wave or something and it gets redrawn <laughs> a little bit farther down than, than you know, what they originally necessarily intended. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is numbers driven. As we talked before, we're not going to go back to the age of abundance. So, they, they being CCP, have a good idea of how much stuff gets used on a daily basis in EVE for manufacturing. So they don't want to put 50% more back into the system. They have to be careful with how much more they put back into the system. So anytime you say, oh, yeah, well, let's just raise the yield on that by 10%. Well, that's whatever that mines, that's 10% more that's going to go into the system every day because your yield is higher. So that affects the whole ecosystem. So you, you have to do those calculations as you wanna change one or two numbers, it affects, and now with wastage, wastage affects what's available, it affects your yield, or it does not affect your yield, I'm sorry, your throughput. So it affects what's available and your throughput. The difference there between yield is, if you have a, a, a big rock and that rock gets doubled, or double the amount of material available, your yield, i.e. how much is per hour you make stays the same, but with wastage, some of that just goes to space dust. So the throughput is put it that way. calculated to how much goes into the ecosystem and into the game. So all those numbers have to be taken into account when you, when you make these changes. And that's kind of a lot of where we are right now is, hey, we, we'd like to see this or that. And, and they have to calculate how much they think that will uh, allow for something to go into the system. Now, the other big bone they're of contention to, was- Because they're trying to balance the entire ecology and this is uh, 
you know, resourcing. It's a big part of what comes into the game. Correct. Correct. And then the, the next big bone of contention, which I'll happily let Suetonia talk about, was uh, the EHP for the subcaps, because I gee, that gives me a headache. Much like mining and all those numbers give a lot of other people a headache, that stuff just hurts. <laughs> so Tony, have you looked at the, uh, uh, the, the I, EHP as effective hit points of the mining barges, I guess is what you're talking about, and I guess the other ships that are involved with mining. And um, there's always been a big discussion, should these things be easy to destroy or or should they be tanky enough to survive? Have you looked at EHP? Uh, yeah, we have on the CSM. Uh, there, there was actually uh, quite quite a lovely, lively discussion about EHP of the exhumers and, to a lesser extent, the Taekwon barges. Uh, I believe CSP put in the, the blog that they put out or the update that they're going to increase the EHP significantly on exhumers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not quite sure where the final numbers are going to settle because I looked at Slack and I think they've changed the numbers again recently a little bit, but uh, it should be around three times higher for exhumers. Ooh. Well, I mean, a skiff, which is a, an exhumers, or, or maybe not, not, maybe not the skiff. Sorry, I mean for the for the for the for the one for the Hulk and the Mackinac, they yeah. should be a lot harder to gank. So hopefully that will mean that people can mine with them a lot more effectively in high sec uh, without getting suicide ganked. Because uh, right. there, there was like the Hulk and the Mackinac were so easy to gank, proportionate to their cost. Mm-hmm. And uh, an, another thing with this patch too is worth mentioning that uh, exhumers are far more powerful than they used to be as well. Uh, a lot of, like the CSP is taking away mining from the Orca and the uh, from the Roku, but they're putting a lot of that back into the uh, into the exhumers and regular mining barges. They're getting way stronger bonuses. The new uh, Type Two mining crystals uh, are a significant boost too, and especially exhumers are also getting uh, extra bonuses as well. Um, I think you've seen a lot. See, they should all mostly be in the uh, spreadsheet that CCP uh, posted publicly recently. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have a look at that. Yeah, um, yeah the actual crystals aren't yeah. getting that much of a bonus. They're going from 1.75 modifier to 1.8. The biggest difference is the 2% duration per skill level of the mining barge getting changed to a 25% yield, um, 5% per level yield. That basically doubles that bonus essentially from 12% to 25%. So that and that all gets modified by the other duration bonuses. The bonuses from the work will get stronger um, by about ten percent, I think, somewhere around there. So it, all of that added together, um, the the Hulk uh, will be a, a monster compared to what it was before, for sure. Yeah, uh, I believe with the the numbers currently, uh, once you like factor into like the inefficiency of raw coal mining, you know, like having to move the raw coal, the drone travel time, like the new raw coal should come fairly close to the current. Uh, sorry, the new Hulk should come uh, pretty reasonably close to the current raw coal. Wow. All right. We brought in some miners to talk this over, uh, or people familiar with mining. Uh, Estreas Khan is here with us, uh, and Shen is here. He's null sec. Uh, Estreas Khan is more low sec. And Ren, who is, uh, uh, I guess, your incursions and other stuff in high sec. So welcome, guys. Null sec as well. Null sec as well. All right. Uh, Do you guys have any observations on some of the changes? Are they hitting the pain points that uh, you guys were concerned about? Let's start with Khan. What's your situation there in um, low sec and high sec with the Orca and all the changes that have happened? How do you see this overall change? Uh, how's it going to affect you? Me personally, I don't really think this is going to affect me that poorly in the long run because I've always been somebody who could multi-box you know, fleets of ships fairly easily and make enough money to support those ships. I think for your average casual player, however, these changes, even with the new blog post, is still going to be a little bit too difficult for, you know, certain people to to not only get the gist of uh, this new mining changes, but also get their, you know, some type of income coming to make reasonable enough for them to risk, you know, possible exhumers or any other type of ships 
um, on field. So I, I, I'm really being as positive as I can be without being poorly negative on stream. But I think for your average player, this is still not doing enough for them. In which way? Well, the Orca, um, I, I, I still, so I'm not somebody who uses Orcas a lot, but I feel like for your average solo player, people who don't AFK mine, which a lot of people assume, uh, but more or less they use the Orca for the tank. Unless you see a lot of these barges get battleship tanks, I still don't feel like this will be enough for them to be able to afford those ships and lose it once and justify the loss for the income that they'll be making. Um, I also feel like that the the changes that they made to the expedition frigates are a step in the right direction, but I still believe that they need to do more with those ships. And I also feel like the porpoise, the porpoise, if you're going to remove the orca and not give these people who enjoy this play style something, I feel at least give the porpoise a larger ore hold or something to give those people who are losing out on their gameplay uh, something to at least enjoy going forward. It's not asking for a lot. For, for the porpoise, that's a ship that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And um, as you, I think it was, hold on, let me make sure it's in the forum post before I say something. By the way, that is the smallest uh, industrial command ship, right? I, I believe they reverted the changes. So I believe they took away the compression and then the, um, the core. Okay. Yeah, there's okay, no changes to the purpose. Yeah, yeah. So, the, but the purpose, it's not. It, there's just no changes now. Um, I think the plan is kind of that was more meant in my mind. Now, this is this is me, Kenneth Feld. This has nothing to do with CSM or the blog. In my mind, that ship was always to be with the expedition frigates when you drop into a wormhole to mine gas and and then leave type thing, and. Uh, I, I don't mind that it got basically no changes now, but when gas compression and that stuff comes in, that's when I, I would like to push for that shift to shine in, in that role, as opposed to being, you know, like a, even a high set booster. I think that that role should be more Orca based, especially with the new core. Okay. Well, I, I respect that, but I still feel like, because for the players who use orcas, I feel like this this updates more stick than carrots. And if yeah. oh, absolutely, there's no doubt the Oracle and the orca mining get nerfed. Period. I, 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 when I was on the show, show last week, that was the first thing I said. But the reason th those ships are support ships, they should not be the gargantuan miners of of the world. They should not be those ships in belt with just drones. AFK mining for until the rock runs out type thing. They they were never meant to be that. I, I realized they got there, not saying yeah. they didn't. Somebody but thought they should. Wait, wait till you see the, the numbers for EHP and that kind of stuff that Sutoni has been working on so, before you completely poo poo subcaps, please. So, so, but yeah. I, I understand your concerns and, and I like to gank as much as the next person, but we also understand that in order to keep mining healthy that you just can't go around at a couple of catalysts and delete any subcap miner and and he, he and and go on about your business so something that needs to be said about the afk style of orcas is i do believe to a certain extent that a lot of players use orcas to afk mine on moons but not in belts um as far as scarcity goes you the average rock in a belt is about what 10 km3 that does not last very long with one drone so the people who use this game style or that play style were not afk and it's important to understand why these people enjoy that ship much uh, that much a lot of the time when i hear from people who use orcas it's, it, it is because of the tank it, it, you know like you, you said kenneth nobody likes being deleted in their 300 million isk ship only making no, 15 right. million an hour um so I, I, I think that CCP really needs to take that into account if they are going to remove the Orca. It's not the AFK style. It's the, the safety of the, the play style well, itself. Right. And, and as Suetonia said, the, the EHP is getting significantly increased. The, the forum post said significantly increased. I don't think those numbers have been uh, released yet. 
and and I'm not the I'm not the the Suetonius, the one to talk about that. But the CSM input across the board was pretty much that these ships have to be usable, and you're going to have to fit a tank. You can't take a what's it the Procure is the little skiff version. You can't just put a couple strip miners on there and some mining upgrades and, and go out. You're going to have to rig it with shield rigs and put a tank on it and stuff. But I think these ships will, will definitely, if, if they're fit properly, um, you know, gankers are either going to have to, uh, you know, get some friends or, you know, move on to a, a lot juicier target. Ren? So my turn. Um, I think the current EHP set up for all the ships is actually really good. You can mine in the Procure and you pretty much can't be ganked. You can mine in a Coveter, you'll mine twice as fast, but you can be ganked if you look at high sec. And the same thing works in null sec. Like the Battle Procure at the moment is a thing because a Procure when fit for battle is actually a pretty beefy tanky thing and can do a fair bit of damage. The issue I think a lot of people have, which I had, was I spent two months at one point getting into a Hulk. I got into a Hulk and then I realized it was 12% more mining yield or 15 if you end up with max skills, but it's another month again to get for a ship that costs almost seven times as much. So I had to be alive in the Hulk for something like 30 hours for it to pay itself off compared to the Coveter. And that was where the issue starts coming in that the difference between the Coveter and the Hulk and the Skiff and the Procure and all that sort of stuff wasn't enough of a gap for the mining to make it worthwhile to use a T2 mining barges. So having this gum in and the Hulk getting a significant buff is actually good, I think. The Orca and the Rorca have been showing up and CCP basically has been saying for six months that they're going to be nerfed and they should be nerfed. If you actually look at the numbers from what I can see, a Rorca Hulk fleet will mine more effectively than a pure Rorca fleet would before. And the Rourke, oh sorry, a Orca Hulk fleet will mine more than an old Orca fleet. So miners are getting a buff here. They just can't just put their Orca on field and come back three hours later. They have to meaningfully move the rocks out of the Hulk into the Orca in some way. Yeah, I mean, really? one of one of the things too for me, right, was uh, the I believe the Orca, like a max yield Orca, would like easily outmine like a skiff, for example, right? Yeah. It would. So, so there was like almost no no point using the skiff when you could just mine more with an orca and it was AFK. But now yeah. uh, with the new crystals and like the new bonuses, uh, and the uh, it should be like a lot more uh, viable to mine with the subcaps. The other really weird thing I find about warships is their shield tank, but I think they're Galente, so it's kind of all a bit weird there. Real, real quick. Yes, they, they do use Galente parts to build them, and they do have Galente, whatever, for the ECM and that kind of stuff. Uh, the let me radar, just radar, out. whatever it is. Yeah, let me just read this out from CCP Psych. We will publish new barge exhumer bonuses and attributes sometime in the next few days. I just want to put that on the record. Go ahead, Kenneth. Yeah, well, and, and yes, that's coming out, but using the graphs that CCP Psych put in his forum post, um, a Hulk will mine about 135% of what a Coveter mines uh, post changes. So you were talking about before, it was about 12%. Now it's about 35%. And that was something that I personally pushed for. I didn't think there was any benefit to going to a Tech 2 ship there or very little benefit. And uh, and I, I pushed hard to get that gap opened up to to, to make the benefit worth it. Yeah, I think that's a good change because there really wasn't much point going into a Hulk unless you're completely min-maxing stuff. Correct, correct. All right, Chen, uh, you came into EVE Online and uh, you saw the pattern. Look, I got to get myself into a Oracle. That's where the big money is. You start following that career path and then boom, they take away that entire profession. Is that what happened? Yeah, essentially. So... <laughs> I started First in all, sorry, like sorry. Venture and then Coveter and then stayed in Coveter for actually a long time and then moved on to the Porpoise and Orca. And so I've worked in HiSec and I use it for HiSec mining. And what I do usually I have two accounts and one is in a Coveter and one is in Orca. 
and then basically mine if i have the covetous hold fold and then i will just move that to the workers hold and actually i have got ganked uh with those two ships like a few times one thing that at least with uh Orca, that you can do is you right click you pull your ship into the ship maintenance bay and the ganker has nothing can, can cannot do anything about it and then you pull your uh drones and then you're safe from there so but like with this patch like a uh, worker is not necessarily that much safer compared to before because you have that industrial core means that uh you're not able to warp away or not able to do anything within five minutes so it's similar to a roku but without a panic which means that uh it's safer in, in a lot of way to use the porpoise uh, which means that the coveter going alongside with that uh, uh, industrial command ship will be less safer because you'll lose that uh, worker's ship maintenance bay um, there and uh, i'm actually really happy to see the uh type b crystals uh, at least i need high sec that's um, i mean is much higher well, a bit higher yield compared to the type a and it's in public area nobody cares about how much uh you waste and then it's, it refreshes every day so it's uh it is a much better crystal to use i think uh, in high sec mm. yeah trading 25 percent yield for a little bit of volatility and a little bit of waste is for for ore belts to get re, redone every day, I mean that's that's crazy town right there. You know, yeah, be crystal every day, all day. Yeah, and if you look at the graph uh, from the TQ one type A and type B, it's actually a very a good amount of increase there uh, from the T, uh, type B to type A, and then type A even to the TQ nowadays with coverters, even like without core active. I think. I mean, I don't know how much, like, say, Porpoise Boost or Worker Boost is going to give that because I think, assuming uh, the core active, core active, it says right there, is the Roku, the industrial core active. So uh, I think we're going to do the math and then see what the numbers going to look like with a Porpoise or Worker Boost. Yeah. Uh, so to be clear, when I said, boom, the profession's gone, that is the AFK Rorqual mining model that people were stamping themselves into. They're just stamping clones of themselves into that. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's been talked about for ages now, for a couple of years uh, and all that. And the changes that this is addressing are, this, this patch is addressing, uh, even though it's the ecosystem in general, are specific to that pattern of uh, mining. So that's what I meant by that profession is gone. and. Um, and, and here's the thing I wanted to get clear. If you were an AFK Rorkel miner, um, that this still, this patch is still bad for you, but if you're a Rorkel miner, that's active, I assume this is still, this is a okay patch. It's How's a that great patch actually, because great patch. Okay. overall the previous fleets for Rorkels, for example, Orcas, you put out 20 Orcas in the field. And yes, run with well, your 20 orcas and your 20 rocks. Now you're going to put out one rock or run one orca and 19 hulks. An orca costs 1.2 billion isk, 1.5 billion isk. A hulk only costs 250 million. So you're putting out a fifth of the isk. The investment in terms of SP is a lot less as well. So your fleet is going to cost a lot less. It's going to take a lot less training time to get into it. And you're going to be mining the same amount of stuff. Like it's actually a really good patch, but. People are going, oh, no. Why are people hops? complaining? Uh, I mean, another part of that is if you actually like, sit down and do the numbers, I it's mean, really good. At least good. right now, what I'm doing, like the active work on mining. Yeah, well, the patch, as far as I know, there wasn't any changes to the orca hull bonuses for mining, was it? So the, the orca is going to drone mine the same post patches as pre-patch. We've attacked two core it's, it's, active. It, yeah. I, I think they took yeah. away the roll bonuses, but then they put it on the tech two core. So as long as you have the core active, you'll mine the same amount. Obviously, I think the the core probably cost some ice to run or something. Kenneth, right? I, like, no, uh, no, heavy water. Yeah, heavy, heavy water. Think, yeah. Like before, like with on TQ right now, it's a hundred percent bonus, and with the core active with the T two compact core is seventy five. So it's a bit of a nerf there. By the way, Sathir uh, brings up good thing there was a motion for skill extractors uh, for the 20 accounts for Rorkels. I think he's making a joke that uh, this is kind of a cash grab on CCP's part to sell extractors, but it seems like a kindness using Astrothi's words, doesn't it? Well, 
I mean, this is yeah, just a case the, of the marketing is... doing a thing without talking to anyone else, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it, Those also... two teams don't even know each other exists. It doesn't look good. The timing's bad, but I don't think there's anything Got specific it. behind Got it. it. <laughs> Check. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Well, but, but you can look at it both ways, right? This is a kindness. If you want to get out, you can do it on the cheap, you know, if you uh, thought that was okay. The one thing you're talking about, the AFK Orca on a moon, um, if that is the case, there is something in this patch for you without ganking, and that is the Type C crystal. Um, you can delete their rocks pretty quickly, and if they're, they're not there to fight you, you can have at it on their rocks. Um, and if they're AFK, they won't know. They'll just come back, hey, where'd my rock go? Um, but the wastage factor or wastage, wastage multiplier on a type C crystal is 18 right now. I think it's 16 on Sissy. It was 18 in the blog. But that being said, uh, the ability to mine and your yield is cut by 20, down to 25%. So only 25% as much goes into your ore hold so you can mine longer and keep deleting that rock, but 18 times that, so effective 4.5 times multiplier of that rock goes into space dust. So if you, if you see an AFK orca out there, rather than gank them, uh, go delete their rocks and you probably have a lot more effect on them that way than you will even try to get a bunch of people together to gank them. But there's no kill board for rocks. I mean, what's the purpose of that except to grief somebody? Yeah, well, I, I mean, if you don't have enough to gank them, then that's the next best thing. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's a PvP game. It's competition, right? Like, uh, you need to shut down your competition if you want to corner the ore market in a particular system. So. Well, yeah, I guess so, if you want to play the long game. Just to me, this, this seems like it's also a, an arena to torture people that you, you, know, that you don't know. Well, there's also, uh, there's, also a useful, there's also other uses for them too, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the, like uh, when raw coal mining was at, at its peak, when uh, dark ochre was completely worthless and no one uh, wanted to mine it, and people had like the ochre first rules, you could just have some, just have some guy uh, delete the ochre rocks with these Type C crystals. So there is, uh, there is good uses for them too. Uh, CCP Sykes said he posted in chat, I believe, with something about the orca yield, maybe. I'm sorry, I don't have Twitch. Yeah, he, he, he said the chat. Orca Yield will be the same with the Tech 2 Core running uh, a little earlier. So. Thank you, yeah, Sam, it may just be the work. way the bonus is applied versus the whole bonuses, but I'm pretty sure with the Tech 2 Core, the Orca um, drone yield is the same pre-patch, uh, or post-patch as it was pre-patch with obviously no core because it didn't exist. Yeah, the, you're, you're leading to your promise a little bit because obviously now it's costing you heavy water to run it, but the actual like ore throughput should be the same. The change I'm going to find interesting is the rock being able to fleet or maybe potentially whole mining fleets onto sites. Like jump, fleet jump, sorry. That they're talking about. Uh, yeah, I think they, they actually mentioned it. It is on Sissy. Um, I, I don't think I can get into too much if Psych wants to uh, answer. There's a little... Something behind the scenes, dev, blah, 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 code, something that they have to work on. And um, I, didn't the forum post say that they're, uh, they'd like want to bring it soon or something like that? Yeah, they're saying early next year. But being able to bridge, yeah. that's yeah. what I was looking for. Bridge the whole fleet in would be pretty cool. Well, I, I don't know that it's, I, I'm not sure how it's going to work, to be honest. But um, remember the, the conduit um, jump. Yeah, the battleships, um, Black Lops. Ops, have the two things now. They can either jump with the stuff or they can bridge. Oh, yeah. And if you look at the naming convention, I think this naming is closer to the one where the ship jumps with the other ships. I'm not I'm not sure. And and mind you, I know, Astarathi, if you're listening, I got you, man. Compact will not make it into the game, I promise. I Everyone knows that that's for that goofy line of meta cap modules. Got it. Um, all these names are placeholders. Hey, I can't wait for people to jump a full fleet of battle pro procurers on people. So. Yes, battle <laughs> procurers. I was waiting for that. 
All right, another change. We'll get the belts in just a minute, uh, Con. But the uh, another change that they're reverting is the frigates. Right, the frigates aren't changing, um, except and, the porpoise. And, I think get some cargo space. Yeah, just right, the old. Yeah. Uh, and and the port and the bonus to the venture got put back. Ha! Ah, thank goodness. So it's still a gas scooper. Yeah, so the the, the 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 venture will still have the same gas shield as before, I believe. And the uh, it, the exhumers and the mining barges should actually mine a bit more because they get the new like gas cloud hoarders or whatever they're called the uh, the mining barge exclusive module. Yeah, there was something like uh, people were salivating over one of those frigates becoming OP. And yeah, the endurance had a really insane uh, drone damage bonus. It had twenty percent drone damage per level, and it had uh, uh, the ability to use five light drones. So uh, people were getting like three hundred and thirty DPS on it. It was doing the same DPS as a worm does, which <laughs> yeah, was a, a little insane. Steroids. But, but they, they've they've reverted that, so uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, so endurance. The worm. All right, but that's yeah. not happening. So, the old mining figure is going to be the best figure in the game. Yeah, to me, a lot of that stuff is based around gas and the compression. So, once gas compression comes in, that's when oh. me personally is going to push for more of the frigate stuff to become a little more, especially the venture, um, to be a little more forefront and, and maybe looking at those ships and tweaking a few things to go along. When com when compression comes back in and the gas compression happens, um, you know that's when the, the the porpoise and the venture and those will. I'm going to push for them to get looked at a little bit more. I don't know that it'll happen, but but in my mind, that's kind of what I'm I'm looking at. The whole compression thing it, it, it feels like everybody think it feels like everybody feels like they have a right to, but it's actually a privilege to compress, isn't it? Because what does compression do? It allows you to take a lot of minerals or gas or whatever and crunch them down, store them in a smaller space so you can move more of them. Why is that a right, not a privilege in a lot of people? Well, uh, they're going to be adding like some like wastage factor to it in the in the future, right? When they eventually, when they get around to uh, changing yeah. compression, so th there'll be more of a decision to make where. It, where there'll be an advantage to using the things that you mine locally versus, you know, compressing them and bringing them to the jitter market or whatever, you, wherever you're taking them. Or making so, more trips. Yeah. Compression kind of needs to happen because CCP is trying to make it that you can't mine everything locally to build your orca. You've got to be able to mine something over in low sec, something in null sec, something in high sec. Without compression, that's not really possible because moving, say, titanium in an orca, in a jump freighter, just doesn't happen. So you kind of need the compression. And from a yeah. physical point of view, gas needs to be compressed because it's the only medium that can actually be compressed in a physical standpoint. It's the only thing in can we can't compress. <laughs> in real life, yeah. And also, I think during the big war, uh, I think Vili talked about this on stream once, uh, that if you look at the ratio from compressed war to destroyers or cruisers, just T1 hulls, it's really big. So you can have a full jump freighter loaded with compressed ores and then jump them into, let's say, a war zone. And then right there, you have, like, say, T2 rig Tataras, and then it's, and then you can refine it, and then you can build, like, a fleet of, let's say, uh, treasures or or caracals, uh, like, that way. So yeah. it's a good way to, let's say, supply the front line. But, yeah, but why do we always assume that bigger is better? Bigger fights are better. Anybody who fights in a big fight knows they're not better. They're slower. Uh, why, you know, okay, we get headlines from big fights. Sure, we've done that for years. But why can't we put limitations on how big fights can be based on the logistic side of it? Getting ships to the battlefield should be difficult. More people should be involved. It should be, uh, why, why can't we look at it in, in that way? As opposed to, hey, if you want us to fight, you need to make everything easy for us to get ships there and to fight. I mean, I mean this doesn't really change like it's like sub capital stuff, does it? Like beyond uh, like get it, and I think like making it easier to get battleships to a war zone is probably something people would want. We're not so like any hacks. anything anything battle cruiser and below isn't really changing. In fact, it would actually be harder to be, to move battle cruisers once you have in the wastage factor because they only use regular minerals, right? 
And then once the compression changes happen and you have more wastage when you're compressing, we you have some level of wastage when you're compressing, uh, like the regular ores to bring in to build battle cruisers, it actually gets harder to do that. The only thing that would be easier would be to build battleships because they require uh, like some uh, other materials, right? But but if you're going to do that, you just bring in, like if if we were still fighting in Delve and and Pappy's home is in the drones veil area, you just build that one or two specific things you need for battleship there and bring them across along with the minerals or you know the compressed ore and then just build the battleships there. It's not, you know, uh, you, it, yeah. it's still fairly easy to do for larger groups. Now, smaller groups, if you're trying to move battleships across the way, then you have to, you know, refactor. Are you really still a small group or not? But we, that's a separate argument, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not that much different. Hmm. All right. Well, <clears throat> let's now talk about belts. Con, you had a, a concern or question or. Uh, not really so much a concern or a question. I just um mm. just wanted to speak a little bit about the new belts. Um, so I think that they're kind of neat. Um, but there's also some things that I would like to encourage CCP look at. Um, and just in case people don't know, on the test server, there's a new belt concept or a new belt design that CCP is working on. Um, roughly, it's a circular sphere of asteroids that sits around. Uh, when you first warp into the belt at zero, it's about 10 to 20 kilometers uh, from the asteroids when you warp in and the asteroids are a lot bigger, but the placement for the asteroids kind of makes it harder for you to, you know, say, for example, if you're mining in low sec, be able to align and warp out if a ganker shows up on you and vice versa, it's harder mm -hmm. for uh, cloakies to also get in range or it's it's harder to de stay decloaked in these new asteroid belts. So I'm I'm hoping because it looks kind of cool, you know, it's a really decent change of pace to the asteroid belts. But I'm hoping CCP just kind of takes a look at that to to see, you know, what are some things that we could do to kind of make that a little bit more easier for people to get in and get out. Obviously, there's things that you could do, like you could bookmark certain positions in the in the asteroid belt um, to stop uh, that stuff from happening. But you know, it's just interesting. It's what I'm getting at. So, so basically, geography. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. That's interesting. The big asteroids preventing you from having a clear aligning out path to get out if you need to in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Interesting byproduct. Some of the old uh, Melsec anoms were the same way. You bounce for, ugh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing's more frustrating than trying to get out and bouncing around an asteroid and getting caught. That sucks. Yeah, All right, well, they, similar stuff in like ratting havens where there are rocks around it too. So like sometimes your ship is stuck when you warp at zero and it's really frustrating to get out. Yeah. So uh, one thing I always hear when veteran players are something is they say, look out for the new guy. So they to do about uh, this patch that was going to make it harder for new guys to mine. Has that been rectified in these new updates? Oh, if you're talking about the uh, wastage, uh, they're they're like reversing it. So like the tech two modules now will have the higher waste. Well, well, they're actually staying about the same as what they were, but the tech one module should now have zero percent wastage. But I actually see this as this like whole concept as like a huge buff for new players because like the exhumers and exhumers are way stronger. They're easier to get into. They cost less, mm. and they're more effective. So. Yeah, it's it's so effective now that mining R sixty fours may actually be done with tech one strip miners to get zero wastage instead of uh, tech two and getting, cause now, uh, hold on, let me see if this is out yet. I wonder if that sounds intended or if that's a byproduct. Well, I'm kidding, uh, um, grabbing some paperwork. I oh. did want to add in, I, I know CCP said they were going to look at this, but I really do hope they don't remove uh, mechs and pyrite from uh, moon moon asteroids. Uh, okay, so so back to my previous point, real quick. The A crystals got a ten percent modifier added to them. So for a T one strip, you're going to go from zero percent wastage to a Tech two strip. The best you can get is forty four percent wastage. 
So that's a huge jump. Now it's quite a big jump in yield, but that means 44% of your R64 is going to be uh, goes to wastage, which uh, let me do the calculation. I think that ends up somewhere in the 35% range. Uh, let's see, two times, yeah, 39% range uh, of the ore that's available to you. So you would waste 60%. So if you, the, the new rock is now, the new, or the old rock is now, the new rock is 2X, 60% of that double rock is going to be not available to you if you use Tech 1 or Tech 2 with Type A crystals. So using a Tech 1 strip on R64 will, will be a huge, huge difference, even if it takes you a little bit longer. So Betten two nine two says, "Is that trading waste for time? Is that a fair characterization?" Yeah. So you can you can yep. either choose yep. to have a better throughput, or you can have like more efficiency. Right. The faster you mine the rock, you know, if you're if you're just this big laser just tearing into the the asteroid, then you're going to have more wastage. Right. You need a bigger, powerful laser. It cuts a. For those of you that do woodworking. The kerf is a little bit bigger, so you slice through and you have more wastage there. Got it. So the uh, the idea then is that the choice is if you really don't care about getting everything out of the belt, uh, you just want to get done, you can go that route. Type um, B. Yeah, type B. And that's more the professional because it's a higher technology. Um, Okay. Yeah, it's it's also like again, it's like a buff for like smaller uh, groups as well, because like a lot of the smaller groups, they're not going to be capable of uh, you know completely cleaning out like an an R sixty four belt or whatever, right? Especially when it comes to the lower end stuff. Uh, like if you if you're in like a small corp that has like six or seven miners, you're probably never going to hit a point where you're mining all of the available materials out of the system. So like going like type two is uh, you know always something that you can do. Yeah, and, and I know for us, a lot of the R4 doesn't get mined either. But now, instead, you put the Type Bs on there. You have some wastage, but you get more than you got before. I mean, overall, the the barges and exhumers, their their buff is significant. It's it's not not something to be, you know. Uh, I don't I don't think we've put out the new numbers yet, but based on the numbers that were in the original dev blog, it's a roughly a 30% buff. So, um, and th I don't think that's gonna change significantly, but um, it, it's it's enough that you need to, to rethink some things there if you're just trying to hoover up everything that you can in, in range. Hmm. So do you guys like where the uh, where these changes are kind of uh, putting, putting the patch that's coming? I should say the revisions to the changes that are coming, you guys happy? Where are you at on this? I mean, I'll I'm, let those I'm, guys go first. Uh, I'm I'm very happy with the changes. I'll put it that way. Uh, there there are some pain points like compression, but I, I think CSP are earnestly trying to, uh, um, you know, address all of the problems and uh, what's coming in this patch. I'm really happy for. Uh, I really like the fact that you know exhumers are going to be really useful again. Yeah, my uh, my biggest problem right now is the, and I'm I'm still still working on this is the is the crystals. The Type A got a 10% wastage probability, which means it's a 44% wastage. So the difference between Type A and Type B used to be a, a like a decision point, right? Now a Type B is 25% more yield. A 20% reduction in cycle time is equivalent to 25% more yield. So you get 25% more yield, but you only go from 44 to 64%, 20% more wastage, but you get 25% more yield. I think when you're making that decision, the, the, that's a no-brainer. No one will use type A. And that really sucks because I have a crap ton of BPOs that are basically, I'll just have to buy all new type B BPOs and just trash everything else. Um, so, and, and the other thing that I'm working on is the difference between type B and type C. The type B right now, if you go from a B to a C, you only waste like 
25, 26% more ore, but you get half as much in your cargo. So say you were in high sec and you found a couple of AFK orcas and you're like, hey, I'm going to delete his ore, use a type C crystal. But the yield that goes in your cargo is only 25% of the, the available, right? That's your penalty for using the type C and you get a flag. Well, instead, use a type B crystal and you don't get a flag. They can't do anything to you and it only cost you about 20%, 25% in the amount of dust that you're creating out there, right? So I want to see the, the wastage modifier on the type C moved up a little bit so that a lot more of it goes to wastage. And I'm talking overall amount that gets removed from the rock, both that goes in your cargo and goes to space dust. There's no doubt that type C makes more go go to space dust, but because that 18x modifier is kicked in after the quarter yield, then the 1.8 modifier and the 20% lower duration on the type B crystal makes the, the total amount lost out of that rock only about 25% more out of a type C crystal. It's, it's really weird the way the numbers work together, but if you just look at how fast that rock goes away, a type C crystal is only about 20, I think it's 26% more faster. So I'd like to see that number go up and a lot more go to wastage there so that those crystals get a little bit further apart so that you can't use a type B crystal for griefing because there's not enough um, incentive there to use the type C and get a flag in high sec. If that if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it it kind of does. I couldn't explain it, but I think I understand what you're saying. It's uh, it's a difference. Type B, Type C. That's where you would make the adjustment between those two. Uh, they should just call the Type C crystal the griefer crystal, shouldn't they? I mean, there's really no, 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 because uh, you're eliminating I... sometimes waste that you don't, and that's your rocks, and you that okay, never mind, never mind. Right, right, yeah. So it's yeah. it's both ways, but um. It's, I, it's got a use I, case. I've got a couple of ideas for some catchy names for it, um, but <laughs> uh, unfortunately, CSM don't get to do a lot of the naming. So they, ha I think they have a lore team or something for that. I'm really not sure where yeah, they get a well, lot of the names from. To take that out of uh, Fozzie's hands, he called modules ample. And for God's sakes, um, all right. Uh, anything else on uh, my? Want to talk about um, or point out? Or in terms of this update, I like the general ideas of update. I don't think the way it's been put out is a good way. Like we're up to like the third or fourth update from CCP, and I'm pretty sure most of us still don't quite understand how wastage work. I think it's overly complicated and it needs to be simplified down quite a bit because once you understand how it works, I think it's a fairly decent way of doing an update. But like we're doing hundreds and hundreds of words to try and work it out and explain it. And Kenneth just did a whole oh, log and I am got lost. I mean, they, they've doubled the amount of ore out there, but you can't have it all. A portion of it. And yeah, the, stuff you can't the actual have. wording and how it works and the mechanics of how it works is overly complicated. It needs to be simplified. I, yeah, and wastage the name of itself, waste. Remember, wastage itself is still just maybe a placeholder name. Um, but but the concept is is very similar. There's every time that you mine, there's a percent chance that some amount goes to space dust or slag or however you want to tailings, however you want to frame that. So Frack. when you mine, if you have a 44 percent wastage factor, then when you mine, a little RNG goes, and you're either yes or no for waste. And if it wastes, then that slag appears or goes poof or whatever happens in space, but that goes away. Then your next cycle comes around, another plus or minus 44% RNG goes, and then you didn't have any waste that time. So everything went in your cargo, nothing went to waste. And it's that simple. And for the type B crystals, everything I believe is a wastage multiplier of one. There may be a few threes out there, but for the most part, it's all one. Type C crystals are a wastage modifier of 18. So all that is is your yield times the wastage multiplier, and that's how much goes to slag when you when you hit the 
the RNG on that. Yeah, it, it, I think uh, something we heard from Caleb, maybe Reva, other people that are looking at this, maybe uh, actually um, Araya, who talks about this in, in smart ways, is uh, flip it around and talk about the efficiency of the laser as opposed to the negative space, right? Talk about the object, not the negative space. So the waste, don't refer to it. Talk about how efficient and, and uh, how good a miner you can be with skills and tools and stuff like that. Maybe. But you know, one thing that one thing that I've noticed over the years is that people will complain about changes. And then when people work out the math, the change isn't really that bad. It might actually be a bonus. And so then so then the, the people complaining are like, well, I'm not going to agree with that. So the messaging, the messaging is the problem. So it goes from the problem problem to okay, the problem's not a problem, but the messaging is a problem. Yeah, I feel like at least with the name waste itself. Like that word can mislead a lot of people uh, in the last dev block. I mean, maybe getting a better name for it, like when it actually comes to TQ, will help a lot. All right. Well, so I still work on it. I I think mining waste isn't a bad idea per se, but I think the end result is going to be kind of counterproductive, or it's going to work against what CCP is planning on doing or wanting to do, which is getting newer players getting involved with mining. I think this the the, the waste mechanic, even with the, the modules, the T1 modules allowing, you know, zero percent waste, I still believe that it's it's gonna hurt the newer players because um, you know, it's it's gonna require them to get more skill points, more ISK, and the veterans who are still already established they're they're not gonna really be well. I don't really care about the the waste you know involvement because once I get to a certain number, the waste won't affect me. Whereas with these newer players who are gonna now have to compete with already established players, they're just, this waste mechanic. I guess is what I'm getting at is really not going to help them in the long run. All right, all right. Well, listen, Kenneth. Thanks so much for doing all this work. Sutonia, you too. I know your number crunching like crazy over there. Uh, getting this thing into shape. Uh, looks like people are being serious about it now and looking at the numbers, and it seems like a lot of the uh, angst is subsiding. Is that a fair characterization from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the initial thing was a pretty big overreaction. That ooh, let's talk about that. No, no, let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, let's not. <laughs> let's talk but, about but that. yeah, he he he's right. The, the first blog people reacted whether it was over or not is is but it was justified right, right? they reacted instantly so, to very complicated changes it makes you suspicious how much number crunching they actually did you know but go on oh it, it, yeah there was it, it wasn't that hard to 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 figure out real quick anyway th but then the other problem was sissy didn't meet the dev block so there was a lot of confusion out there in addition to the mad so then there was people that were mad about the real numbers there was people mad about the sissy numbers and then once you got the people with the sissy numbers to look at the dev blog numbers then less of them were mad but some of them were still mad so the, there it, yeah it was just a it was a process um and the the other thing that i have push for is um, when we do update, updates like this to Sissy that are early, the shift traits didn't get updated. So uh, I, I've asked for, you know, maybe just delete the shift traits. That way people have to look at the attributes and people are, they log in the Sissy, show info, oh, that shift didn't change. But in fact it had, it's just that the shift traits hadn't changed yet. So I spent, uh, the better part of a day fielding those DMs on on Discord, um, and so the, just a, for stuff that we're putting out early like this um, that people aren't used to seeing, few behind the scenes changes. But I think overall it it, it went well, um, but with a few tweaks, it, it could go really really well. Yeah. And again, CCP opened that process up saying, test this, it's not finished. Obviously it's less finished than usual and go out there and uh, you know kick the tires. And you guys have, you guys uh, have gotten back to CCP and they're being faithful to what they asked, for, you know, uh, promised, which was to make some adjustments and they're doing that. So I think the process worked out. 
Uh, and that's good. It's nice to see this process working out. Okay, last call for anything on mining. We're going to go to just a couple of news items and then we got to go. Um, fine. So uh, if you guys haven't seen, Eve Online has the Pulse videos that come out. Whoever is doing the Pulse videos, congratulations on making amazing content. It's the best stuff I've seen since Eon Magazine in 2007. Uh, these Pulse videos are terrific. And the, uh, the guy presenting them is fantastically, fantastically um, talented and funny and engaging and charismatic and everything else. Great videos. Watch Pulse videos. And uh, you also have Community Beats, the community team's putting out stuff that's going on with players and what they put out. You should check that out if you get a chance. This Community uh, Beat came out uh, for November or the 19th of November. We had the monthly economic report. We'll tackle that. And we did tackle that in a different show on The Daily Show. We'll talk about um, that later on, uh, but not today. And the last thing is a couple of news items from players. Uh, Null Secnia, sorry, uh, yeah, Null Secnia Shorpen, which is NSH, uh, has imploded. And that happened uh, in the middle of the Pacific night, basically. So it was, it was a deep US time zone. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then the faction Fortizar went down, the Prometheus Fortizar went down clear and present threat own that and it has been destroyed by dark chapter uh, those things are becoming more and more rare okay uh, nsh was the big player news anybody have any details on that if not um uh, they are I, I think like they had a keepstar that they used to own and then the, tr the transferring went uh uh, didn't go well, and then there's some conflict there that we're gonna see. <laughs> okay, uh, no, well, good try, uh, Shen. You get points for that. What uh, NSH is basically, I don't know if this is a fair characterization, but I'll put it out there. They're kind of like the U.S. time zone for fraternity, right? Because uh, they are PVPers, they do a lot of that, and they near fraternity and they had some kind of um, good relationship with fraternity they were living in mtac o the keep star there that belonged to them and they also had a satio and other things around them including some i hubs and and that's what was going on with them you'll remember nsh uh they've been around for a while they've done some good things they appeared with snuff and took out rc in uh amamaki that one time they took out like seven titans that was a real big surprise to see nsh involved with snuff so what was going on there well that relates to what happened recently that was a while ago um you also saw nsh uh sitting in um uh what's the what mtaco is in tribute i kept wanting to say geminate but it wasn't it's in tribute uh and so what happened was the two leaders of uh, NSH, I think they were two of the leaders, went to snuff uh, Wally Marks and Anur. And Wally Marks, I don't know if he's that active anymore, but Anur um, went to snuff. And so Pittsburgh from Original Sinners, you'll remember them from near the end of the war on the Pappy side of things. Uh, Original Sinners was a corporation of FCs that you did the US time zone FCing for NC DOT. And there was an acrimonious departure for original sinners. They went over to NSH. So uh, Pittsburgh, uh, who wasn't part of that, that I'm aware of, uh, the acrimony anyway, when it said some things uh, like, hey, you guys, uh, Anur uh, is with Snuff now. He's not really with us anymore. So you guys can stop talking to him and telling him what we're doing or whatever. And uh, Anur didn't like that, didn't like that they were, you know, that uh, Pittsburgh was saying that. So Anur basically pushed the button and destroyed a bunch of things. Uh, and, and that's kind of what happened. So because he, Anur was still in the executive court, because I suppose mismanagement at the top level, uh, a guy from Snuff or a, a former NSH guy that built this thing, didn't like the way it was going. He was in Snuff, turned around, went back to his old team and destroyed it. That's kind of what happened. Uh, so you will see fraternity probably move in and destroy these structures, take over the iHubs, and fix the situation. 
take all the groups that were kicked out of NSH, put them in a new alliance and reinstall them in that area. And this will be a momentary speed bump. But I think that is essentially what happened there. So anyway, uh, Shen, were you just involved in a fight? Was something going on? Yeah, so in, in pass, uh, so there was a fire astro house anchoring in, in pass, mm -hmm. and uh, people formed for that, and uh, and there's a battle. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I mean, the astro house is destroyed. So, but like, so they didn't show up for the uh, fight yeah. on the astro house, but. When we were done with Astro, I was on our way to destroy another structure, I think, and that, and then that's when they they came in, and then we had a fight on the gate. Yeah. Um. So you guys are still alive and well? Is Evictus dead? No. Nope. Okay. All right. I'm not pushing him into the grave. I'm just asking. <laughs> I found out Evictus actually comes from. I don't know why they named their alliance Evictus, but Evictus is the name of the ship in Foundation. I just started watching that series. So check that out. Um, all right. So you still have your coalition, PIBC, which is you, Evictus, and Sever uh, Severance? No. Well, Severance is on the fire side, I think. So it's not Severance, well, it's Vindictive. Vindictive. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I always get that confused. And they're all still healthy and good. Yeah, we're living in Esoteria right now. So this fight literally just happened when we were on air. Uh, yeah, and then here's a battle report. Uh, I, I still, it's 10% tie dye, so it's really, really bad. Oh. Um, yeah, so I don't want to, I, I still don't understand like some of like how these things go either way. I have to talk to people about it. Yeah, but so here's a battle report for now. Thank you. And Fire Coalition is is in your area. And well, it's more like RC, it's a war between RC and uh, and Fire. Wrecking, yeah, Wrecking, Wrecking Crew, crew. Fire Coalition. Yeah, They've yeah been fighting then, for a while now. Yeah, and then just keep brewing, keep brewing, and then and then it turned to like a larger scale fight, and that's what we're seeing today. Got it. All right, cool. All right, well, that's it uh, for today. You guys have anything else before we go? Thanks, Kenneth, again, for coming by. Suetonia, it's been great uh, to hear you guys from the Council of Stella Management. Uh, good luck with the uh, changes in working with CCP. Congratulations on a successful Alliance tournament. Uh, thank you, Khan and Shen and Ren, who took off uh, for hanging out with us and uh, taking up the mining cause. And Nick, thank you for uh, being around and doing the uh, engineering. Really appreciate it. That's all we have time for this week. We will see you next time on Talking in Stations.